Okay, there is, in my book, I have a chapter on quantum consciousness, which is perhaps the most bizarre form of consciousness in all of science. According to the quantum theory, in order for something to exist, somebody has to look at it. Somebody has to make an observation. Before you thing, in principle, it could exist in all possible states. When you look at it, it then assumes one state. Therefore, the observer, in some sense, determines existence. But observation requires consciousness. Conscious people make the observation. So the greatest paradox in all of science is the cat problem, the Schrodinger cat problem. If I have a cat in a box, and I, I don't open the box, the cat could be either dead or alive. So how do we physicists describe a cat that you cannot observe? Well, we add the dead cat to the live cat. We add the two waves together. So the cat is neither dead nor alive until you open the box. Now Einstein thought, this is stupid. I mean, how can you be neither dead nor alive at the same time? Well, what can I say? Einstein was wrong. Electrons can be spin up or spin down. Electrons can be here or there at the same time. So this is the greatest paradox in all of science. How do you resolve the fact that you can have dead cats and live cats simultaneously exist in another state before you make the observation? And if you, if you ever find the solution to this puzzle, Tell me first. <laughs> I must disagree with my esteemed colleague here. Okay. E except first for the of all, part. let me say that <laughs> science is the engine of prosperity. From steam power to electricity to the laser to the transistor <coughs> to the computer. That's not true. We're That's talking technology. about. Hey, mate, technology. Hey, can I have my. Can sure. I have my say? Okay. sure. You had your say. Let yes. me have my say. Yes. However, the information revolution has a weakness, and the weakness is precisely the educational system. The United States has the worst educational system known to science. Our graduates compete regularly at the level of third world countries. So how come the scientific establishment of the United States doesn't collapse? If we're producing uh, a generation of dummies, if the stupid index of America keeps rising every year, just watch network television and reality shows, right? How come the scientific establishment of the United States doesn't collapse? Let me tell you something. Some of you may not know this. America has a secret weapon. That secret weapon is the H-1B. Without the H-1B, the scientific establishment of this country would collapse. Forget about Google. Forget about Silicon Valley. There would be no Silicon Valley without, without the H-1B. And you know what the H-1B is? It's the genius visa, OK? You realize that in the United States, 50% of all PhD candidates are foreign born. At my system, one of the biggest in the United States, 100% of the PhD candidates are foreign born. The United States is a magnet sucking up all the brains of the world, but now the brains are going back. Right. They're going back to China. They're going back to India. And people are saying, oh my God, there's a Silicon Valley in India now. Oh my God, there's a Silicon Valley in China. Duh. Where did it come from? It came from the United States. So don't tell me that science isn't the engine of prosperity. You remove the H-1B visa, and you collapse the economy. In Wall Street Journal, editorialized against a congressman who wanted to ban the H-1B, saying they'll take jobs away from the American people. The Wall Street Journal said, look, there are no Americans who can take these jobs. These are at the highest level of high technology. They don't take away jobs for Americans. They create entire industries. We, we, and so that's why we have an Achilles heel, and that's the educational system. The and again, sociology irony, majors irony is, are not necessarily going to be the ones determining the future of Silicon Valley. The, I, but physicists, okay. the engineers, is, the we need more of them, not less. The irony is, the irony is. So let's talk about the brain. First of all, blood flow can be analyzed by MRI scans. On the left is your brain, the blood flow in your brain when you tell the truth. Not much happens.
But on the right is when you tell a lie. Ah, yes, when you tell a lie. When you tell a lie, first you have to know the truth. Then you have to create the lie. Then you have to create the cover-up and the consistency with the lie with all the previous lies you've been telling all these years. <laughs> That's a lot of brain power. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> now, what have we learned from these brain scans? Well, we learned that the most ancient part of the brain is the back of your brain, the so-called reptilian brain. The brain has evolved from the back to the front. When infants are born, the back of the brain is most developed. That's the reptilian brain. When you have a car accident and you have whiplash, your balance, your sense of territoriality, aggression, simple things like that in the back of the brain are affected. And as the brain grows from infancy into adolescence, the center part of the brain develops. The limbic system, the monkey brain, the brain of emotions, the brain of etiquette, politeness, social norms, that's the center of the brain. And then finally, when you become an adult, the prefrontal cortex at the front of the brain develops. So we can now test old wives' tales by looking at the living brain. One old wives' tale says, every parent knows this, that their teenage kids suffer from brain damage. <laughs> it's true. You can actually show that as the brain develops from the back to the front, teenagers do not have a well-formed prefrontal cortex. It's another old wives' tale that when a man talks to a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. <laughs> it's true. When a man talks to a pretty girl, blood literally drains from the prefrontal cortex and he becomes mentally retarded. Okay? You can measure this by looking at blood flow. It's absolutely true. Okay? So all these old wives' tales can now be systematically analyzed looking at MRI scans. It's really hard to sell kids on math and science. It's really easy to sell kids on cigarettes. Would it help if we made science illegal? There's another way to make science uh, interesting for people. First of all, we are born scientists. When we're born, we wonder what's out there. We begin to wonder about the sun, life, the stars, uh, what makes the oceans, the weather. We're born scientists. And then something happens. When we hit the danger years, the danger years of junior high school and high school, that's when it's literally crushed out of us. Those are the worst. Every little flower of curiosity, said Einstein, is crushed by society itself. Because we have to learn all these facts, figures, memorization, we think that memorization is science. And that's not true at all. Uh, my daughter had to take the Regents exam once, and she had to memorize all these facts and figures about minerals, crystals, for a geology exam. Nowhere did I see the true driving force of geology, which is continental drift. That's the organizing principle for all of geology. And yet the exam was memorizing all the names of the crystals and the minerals. And then later she comes up to me and says, Daddy, why would anyone want to become a scientist? That was the most humiliating event in my entire life. I felt like taking that book and ripping it apart because that exam was crushing, crushing curiosity right out of the next generation. And then we wonder, hey, how come people are not more interested in science? Duh. On one side, we have my esteemed colleagues who are 100% certain that the universe is pointless, meaningless, and there is no God. On the other side, we have another group that is 100% certain the universe has a point, has a meaning, and there is a God. One side's right, one side's wrong, right? My personal point of view is they're both wrong. What is science? Science is based on decidable statements. If I drop my cell phone, I know it's decidable that it will fall under gravity. Science is based on statements that you can test, reproducible, decidable, falsifiable. But the question of does God exist, does the universe have a point, is undecidable. It is not part of science. It's like trying to disprove a unicorn. 
Let's say you want to disprove the existence of unicorns. It's really hard to do because maybe some island, maybe in outer space, there are unicorns. How do you prove that unicorns do not exist? Very difficult. Now, I'm a physicist. My goal in life is to complete Einstein's dream of an equation perhaps no more than one inch long that will summarize all physical knowledge and allow us to quote, read the mind of God. So what was his point of view toward God? Einstein said there really are two types of God and that's the source of confusion. The first God is the personal God, the God of vengeance, the God that smites the Philistines, the God that answers your prayers, the God of Moses and Isaac and Jacob. Einstein said he couldn't believe in that God, but there's a second God, the God of Spinoza, Leibniz, the God of harmony, beauty, simplicity, elegance, that the universe could not have been an accident. So I see no evidence of God. However, that doesn't mean that there is no existence, uh, there's no meaning, that doesn't mean there's not a purpose or a God out there. I just can't see it in the equations of physics. When we physicists look in outer space for alien life, we don't look for little green men. We look for type 1, type 2, and type 3 civilizations. A type 1 civilization has harnessed in planetary power. They control earthquakes, the weather, volcanoes, they have cities on the ocean, Anything planetary, they control. That's type one. A type two civilization is stellar. They've exhausted the power of a planet, and they get their energy directly from their mother star. They just don't get a sun tan on a weekend. They use solar flares. They use the power of the sun itself to energize their huge machines. Eventually, they exhaust the power of a star, and they go galactic. They harness the power of billions of stars within a galaxy. Now, for example, Buck Rogers would correspond to a type 1 civilization, a planetary civilization. Star Trek and the Federation of Planets, who have colonized a few star systems, would correspond to a type 2 system. And the empire of Star Wars would correspond to a type 3 civilization. Now, what are we on this scale? We are type 0. We don't even rate on this scale. We get our energy from, not from stars or galaxies, we get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. But we can calculate when we will attain type 1 status in about 100 years. Now, every time I read the newspaper, I see evidence of this historic transition from type 0 to type 1. And I am privileged to be alive in the most important era in the history of the human race, the transition from type 0 to type one. I read the newspaper and I see evidence of this everywhere. What is the European Union? The European Union has been formed to oppose NAFTA, that is the United States, Canada and Mexico, but why? Because we're seeing the beginnings of a type one economy. Huge planetary trading blocks are the beginnings of a type one economy. And what language will this type one economy speak? Everywhere I go around the world, I find that the elites, the elites all speak English as a second language. In the future, the planet Earth will be like that. Everyone will speak their own native language, but on top of that, there will be a type one language, probably English. There's also gonna be a type one culture and a type one political system as well. You can go anywhere on the planet Earth and show people pictures of two individuals that are instantly recognizable by any human, Madonna and Arnold Schwarzenegger. In other words, we're talking about Hollywood movies. We're talking about rock and roll, rap music, blue jeans. That's going to be the planetary culture of the planet Earth. And what is the internet? The internet is the beginning of a type one telephone system. That's all it is. And so this transition is perhaps the most important transition of all time. Some people don't want it. They fear this transition because this transition is to a planetary civilization tolerant of many cultures. 
These are the terrorists. The, in their gut, they fear this because they know they are witnessing the birth pangs of the beginning of a new planetary civilization and the terrorists want nothing to do with it. This has gotten the attention now of Apple computers and Microsoft. They're looking into this. On the lower left, maybe one day you will simply control your laptop by thinking. The headset will pick up radio from the brain, computers will decipher the signal and move the cursor. You can already type. We can already type by the power of the mind because computers can now decipher what you are thinking about. In fact, in the future, one day, when you walk into a room, you may mentally turn on the lights, mentally set the thermostat, mentally turn on the TV, mentally call for the car, and mentally drive the car just by thinking about it. But not just a laptop. Why not an exoskeleton? This is what's being done at Brown University, Duke University. They put a chip right on top of the brain. It doesn't hurt because the brain doesn't have any pain sensors. Then this chip is connected to a laptop, which then controls a wheelchair. This gentleman here had a stroke. He is a vegetable. He cannot scratch his nose. He cannot talk. He cannot do anything but blink. Blink is the only thing he can do. At Brown, they put a chip in his brain connected to a computer, he can now